Well, good morning, Second Church. Good morning. That was a good, hearty good morning. Let's try it again. Good morning, Second Church. Good morning. All right. Well, it's so good to see everybody here uh, braving the cold January morning. Um, I'm glad that I'm here and back. I was out for probably the better part of a month, just not feeling well, and uh, thank, thank the Lord that he helped me to recover and heal me and got me back here. So I missed all of you. I missed being here at church, and it's so great to be back with everybody uh, that is not only here in person, but also watching um, either on Facebook or YouTube later on. So um, we're glad that you're here. We're glad that you made the decision to come here and worship here at Second Church of Plymouth. And uh, we have a great sermon. Uh, Pastor TC is going to be here to start a seven-part series on different aspects of congregationalism. Um, so you got to make sure you come back every, every single week so you don't miss any of the seven parts. It's very important. Um, so without further ado, we'll get going. And I just want to thank you for coming again. And uh, let us glorify and worship God and give him all the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey there! Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. 
We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Yes, welcome to church. Aren't we lucky to be able to be here to worship our wonderful God today? Amen. So as we begin our worship today, let us remember the love that Christ has for us. And may the love of Christ be with you. And also, and also with you. you. Please join us on our first song, Somebody's mm. Knocking at Your Door. All rise if you're able or if you want to. <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. <laughs> Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, children, why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door. Jesus is knocking at your door. Jesus is knocking at your door. Oh, children. In times of trouble, God is with us. In good times, God is with us. In every moment of your lives, God is with us. Thank, Thank you, God, God, for, for always being, being there, there for us. us. And please join us on our next song, Blessed Be Your Name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. When I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes. be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road Offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. 
Kids who didn't run out, oh, they're coming back. I was gonna say, <laughs> the kids that didn't run out during that song, if they'd like to come up and join me for the uh, kids' message. Good morning. How are we doing? What's that? Oh, all right. My dog does that too. We're getting to a certain age. I can't believe that it's been about a month since I was last here preaching. It was the day after Christmas. A month has gone by. You know what the good news is? We only have 11 months to go until it's Christmas again. <laughs> right? So that's good news. Did you guys get any good uh, Christmas presents? Good gifts? What did you get? What's, what was the favorite gift that you got? Nice and loud so I can hear you. The Barbie. A Barbie? They're yeah, that's nice. How about you? Do you get a, a you have a favorite gift that's not already like broken or anything? A what? A hoverboard. A hoverboard. Wow, that sounds really fancy. Yeah, it's really fun to get gifts at Christmas time, and some of them are our favorites. Did you get a, a really nice Christmas gift that's your favorite? A remote control car. car. Wow, that sounds really nice. The gifts that we get at Christmas are great, and I hope they last a long time, and I hope they bring you a lot of joy. But speaking of gifts, there's one thing that I want to ask you to do for me today. We're going to read the scripture in a little bit from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and probably about halfway through or so, you're going to hear the word gifts a couple times. So I want you to do something. When you hear that word, you don't have to make any noise, but just give me, a, give me a thumbs up or raise your hand that you noticed that, okay? And I want you to think as we have that scripture reading about gifts, and it talks about gifts that all the people get, that includes you guys too, young kids, Older folks, everybody has gifts that God gives them. And so I want you to think about those gifts and ways that you have gifts that you can help the church. Okay? All right. So remember, when you hear that part of the scripture reading, make sure that you give me a signal, okay? Let's have a quick little prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be church together this morning, young and old and everyone in between, and we ask that you make your will known to us through the gifts that you give each one of us, that we all work together, no matter how young, no matter how old, no matter how quiet, no matter how loud, no matter how tall or short, we all work together with our gifts that you give us, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you very much. us all to take a moment to prepare ourselves to receive the word of God as it comes to us this morning from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Paul writes, I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Here ends our reading of God's holy word. May he bless us with understanding as we are blessed to stand under his word. Amen. I know that some of you are already asking because I've been asked, so what do we call you? And I, I, I understand that. I understand it's an important question. People need to, you know, to get to know you. They want to know your names. I was going around this morning uh, before worship service started testing myself and saying, did I get your, do I remember your names right? And making sure because that's how we get to know one another. We get to know one another by saying each other's names and trying to remember the names and establishing that connection. And the names are important. Um, everybody that I consider a friend anyway, calls me TC. My wife doesn't call me TC, but everybody else calls me TC. And I, I'm not 100% sure how I got that nickname. I mean, I do know that it's my initials, and I get that. I'm, I'm smarter than I look. I'm but um, I know that when, when I was in seminary, I had a friend. And I, I don't, I'm not sure I even remember his name. It was Billy, Billy something. Billy O. I always called him Billy Ball. And uh, he, he and I, we... we Every sport there was, we played. And uh, Billy Ball always called me Top Cat, you know, like the old uh, cartoon with Officer Dibble and, and, and all that. And, and I think that that just kind of stuck. And I think that's where TC came from. And then when I was an air traffic controller, we referred to one another through our operating initials. So TC really stuck. That's how. At work, we would identify each other. That's how we would end our phone calls. I always think I'm kind of glad that my name wasn't Pete Unger or something like that. Because <laughs> then people would point at me and say, P.U. Right? <laughs> so that name, that name TC, just always stuck. You're free to call me TC. If you call me something other than that, I may not turn around and, and answer you because I'm just not used to it. But what we call each other our names, is very important. I, I, I get that. On the other hand, we read in Scripture today, when Paul writes this letter to the church at Ephesus, he talks about something completely different. He talks about roles. He doesn't really focus on names too, too much. And he talks to the people in this church, just like I mentioned with the kids up here a little bit ago, about how important it is that we have our gifts that God gives us. And in those gifts, there is a wide diversity. But even in this diversity of gifts that we all have, there is the unity of faith because Paul tells them all these gifts work together for what? To build the body of Christ, right? The gifts work together to build the body of Christ which, of course, is the church. The gifts are not for you to engage in self-aggrandizement. Is that for a nice college word? <laughs> They're not for you to go around and make money. They're not for you to go around and do 
things that draw our attention to yourself, but they're for you to go around and do things that help build up the body of Christ. And he specifically mentions some, some gifts. He talks about the apostles. And the apostles simply are those who have some kind of personal encounter with the risen Jesus, and through that have been commissioned to preach. He talks about the um, prophets, and those are the people who speak, to stimulate, to warn, to motivate. He talks about evangelists, the people who go around, who travel and preach, and he talks about pastor and teacher. That's one, that's one word. In the Greek, they use, uh, Paul uses the word poimen, which refers to shepherds. And in English, we translate that as pastor and teacher, and that's one office. And Special bonus points for anybody who can remember without looking down at the Bible. What was the purpose of that? I know in general it's to build up the body of Christ. But he talks about the office of pastor and teacher, which is to do what? To equip the saints to do ministry. Right? The office of pastor and teacher, the poimen, or shepherd, is to equip the saints to do ministry. So he mentions these, these four different offices, these four different gifts, and how they work together. They're all kinds of speaking. They all preach in some way. But the office of pastor, poimen, shepherd, has a particular aspect to it that's stressed in the use of that word poimen, which stresses the nature of shepherd. Elsewhere in the New Testament, the word episkopos in Greek is used, also to refer to the office of pastor, and that stresses more the overseer. You might recognize from the word episkopos that we get episcopal, episcopalian, and that is the, uh, refers to the office of bishop or overseer. In the congregational tradition, we don't have bishops. We don't have overseers in that sense of uh, someone who looks over groups of churches and rules them, but instead that word overseer highlights and goes with the office of pastor, poimen, shepherd. Now, why is any of this important to us? Well, this is very important to us. As a church right now, we're in a search process. We're in a search process to call a settled pastor. It's very important to know, then, what is a pastor? What is a pastor if we're looking to fill that office? Very often, the term pastor will be used as a title. And you will see people referred to as pastor. I'm referred to as pastor. People who have pastored here before have been referred to as pastor. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Pastor isn't so much a title as it is a function. But it's normal for us to use it as a title, especially if that person is serving and fulfilling that function. Is it wrong? No. And, and, and I know I've had some conversations with some of you before about this, and uh, until I got to this point where I could really kind of, you know, give, you know, more of an explanation of what I was talking about, you know, maybe some of those things might have been taken the wrong way, and for that I apologize. I certainly never meant to uh, imply that, you know, if you use the wrong title like, <clears throat> some, you know, some buzzer is going to go off and, you know, they're going to deduct points from us or something like that, and then we'll be in third place among the churches, and then seventh, and then before you know it, we're the worst church ever. No, no, of course, nothing like that. There's no, there's no legal ramifications of, of, of misusing someone's title. I used to be a Roman Catholic priest, and I was, I was used to be being called father. I still get that, especially if I wear a Roman collar and go into a hospital or anywhere to visit someone, even if I just have the Roman collar on and I run into the store on the way home, someone's going to call me father. It just, it, just, it just goes with the territory, and there's nothing wrong with that, and that's fine. I don't get offended. I don't gasp. I don't you know, sit there and draw them a chart or anything like that. But there are a lot of titles, pastor, reverend, chaplain, minister, that it's probably helpful for us to understand as we go through a search 
and as we decide to call a pastor. I've been a chaplain too. I was a chaplain for the Weymouth Fire Department for a number of years. Chaplain, what does that mean? For the most part, I provide some kind of religious services. I, I did a lot of prayers for them. I did a little lot of uh, services. I was available for, for calls for certain situations. Minister, you hear that term used a lot of times. Churches, instead of saying they're calling a, a settled pastor, they're calling a settled minister or their senior minister. That highlights the term that they perform ministry. But as we know, especially from reading here, we're all ministers, right? We're all called to do ministry together. So, uh, and, and, and the term reverend. The term reverend is used often because that's a title, but any one of you, if you are not a reverend already, you could be so by the end of the day. All you'd have to do is go home, and there are sites on the internet. You go on there. Some of them are free, and some of them you pay a few bucks, and you'll, you'll, be, you'll be a reverend before the end of the day. <laughs> and, you know, so what's in a name? Uh, not too, too much, because we could call one another ministers, because that's uh, absolutely true. You, you could be a reverend very easily by going online and, and getting an ordination. But pastor is something different. Why? Not because it's a higher title, not because anybody who gets that title or gets that name is somehow special, but because it's a biblically instituted office that God puts into place. Why? For the building of the church. Not for the fame or the standing of the person I can assure you there is nothing fancy, highfalutin, or special about me. Okay? I, I readily admit I am just a doofus. I am just a guy. I love God, and I love God's Word, and I love preaching, and I feel like I've been called to do it. But am I anything special? Absolutely not. And if you don't believe me, you can ask my wife. <laughs> and she will tell you. Despite the fact that for all those years that my mother told me how special I was, there's really nothing special. <laughs> I know I've mentioned before, I wear this black robe in the tradition of congregational ministers and congregational pastors. This robe is not because like, I'm like you know, a judge or anything like that or, or to, to draw attention, but the exact opposite. It's so that you don't even focus on me. There's nothing just but a blank black board there and the focus is right here on God's word rather than on the person. So as we as a church continue in our search to call a settled pastor, where should our focus be? On titles and calling someone who has that title and then we start focusing on that person and when we start to focus on the person we start to focus on their attributes, and yeah, I like him, or I like her. Or should we focus on the office? And if we focus on the office, we are reminded through Paul's writing that the role of the pastor is to guide, to shepherd, to teach. And what does a pastor, oh, excuse me, what does a shepherd do with the sheep? All right, I'm trying to pick some words out there, but I, but I didn't get it. Try it one more time. He protects them. From what? From the elements? Well, they're out in the field, and I can't do much run over with an umbrella. Other animals? Predators? Absolutely. The, 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 the shepherd protects the sheep from enemies from predators, from anything that would do them harm. And the pastor is required and charged to do the same thing. There are not wolves that are going to be coming in here and nipping at your heels uh, during the service. But Paul does talk about, we must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. Ooh, what could he be talking about there? How many of you have ever been in churches over the years and seen deceit and trickery and scheming, maybe even crazy doctrine? Yeah, it happens. 
Yes, it does. <laughs> and don't feel bad. Don't feel bad because, oh, we've had that at Second Church of Plymouth. There's something wrong with us. Read Paul's letters. Oh, my gosh. The things that went on in those churches and the way that they... Paul at one point even talks about the people who hustled the gospel for a buck. That happened in those days, too. Now, I know from my being here for a little while and talking to people that in the past there have been some growing pains at different times in the church and with different pastors and things and you know maybe things were said that people didn't like and some people did like it and some people didn't like it and okay it's in the past and we'll move on from there and I encourage you to move on and I'll try and help you to move on and look forward to what a new pastor will bring to this pulpit and to this office. And I will point out that what it should be is very simple. Just God's word. Just God's word. Because the authority or the credibility of this office of pastor comes exclusively from that. If I were to get up here as a pastor and start giving you my opinions on everything, and start talking about my beliefs and my ideologies and my doctrine and try and get you on board with what I think, I would not be doing my job. I'm not really protecting or guiding or teaching the flock. What I do is to present God's word, and at times when I will say, here's how I see it, I'll identify that as such, and I should because you should be able to understand when I'm speaking my opinion and when I'm speaking God's word. And it basically comes down to that. So instead of focusing on titles and persons, we focus on the office. And we focus on the office and the function of pastor as teacher. And in there, we will find the answers to all our questions. Because when we say, well, what are we looking for in a pastor? What kind of person? When you focus on the role, when you focus on the function, all the questions that you have that are related to the person will be tied to that. And those are the things that are important. You don't need to like me. I don't need to like you. I hope we do. I hope we get along really well for the time that I'm here. But I do hope that you judge me, not on how good looking I am. <laughs> Why is that funny? Right. I hope it's not on the stories that I tell you. I hope it's not on the vehicle that I drive or the way that I dress. But I hope it's on the role that I fill, and how faithfully I fill that. Because that's good practice for what it is that you will be doing in the future. I'm going to share with you something. Every Sunday when I preach, I say a prayer. And the prayer is from Martin Luther, the great German theologian, and it goes like this. O oh Lord God, dear Father in heaven, I am indeed unworthy of the office and ministry in which I am to make known thy glory and nurture and to serve this congregation. But since you have appointed me to be pastor and teacher, and the people are in need of the teachings and instructions, O oh, be thou my helper and let thy holy angels attend me. Then, if you are pleased to accomplish anything through me, to your glory, and not to mine or to the praise of people, grant me, out of your pure grace and mercy, a right understanding of your word, and that I may also diligently perform it. O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, shepherd and bishop of our souls, send your Holy Spirit that he may work with me Yea, that he may work in me to will and to do through your divine strength according to your good pleasure. 
the title. The name is indicative of what they do. The title pastor is indicative of that office. If we focus on that office and we focus on what it is that that office is there to do, I am confident that all the other questions will fall into place. So, pray. Pray for this church. Pray for everybody who's involved, and that is everybody who's involved in choosing your next settled pastor. And pray that in our time together, we can get ready for that, we can learn together, we walk together, and we'll talk more about that in the upcoming weeks. But for today, I don't care what you call me. I really don't. It really doesn't matter. My name is TC. That's good enough. I'm going to try and learn all your names and get to know you so that we can take this walk together, so that we can work together, not for anyone's glory, not for anyone's purposes, but for one reason alone, as it says right here, for the glory of God and the building up of his church. May it be ever so. Amen. 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 In our time of prayer this morning, I do ask that in addition to the names that you'll see on your screen, whether you're here or at home, please continue to pray for them. I would ask that, and, and, and forgive me, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how we do this, but at some point uh, would you add the, um, the search committee onto that. Please pray for our search committee. and would also ask us to pray for whoever your next pastor is. I believe that candidate is out there already. I believe that candidate has already been chosen by God. I believe that candidate is already in the works. I don't mean that the search committee has chosen them, but I believe that God has chosen that person. So pray for that person that he or she will listen to the movements of the Spirit and feel the presence of God in his or her heart and respond to that call. I would also ask you to pray for all the churches in our association that are going through this time of transition and this time of search, not only here in Manomet, but also in uh, Marshfield, also in Pembroke, also in Wollaston. So pray for all our sister churches that are going through times of transition, discernment, and call. And I would also ask you to pray in the silence of your own hearts for all the things that you have to pray for, to be thankful for, the things that you are concerned about, the things that you need God's direction on, and also, most importantly, today especially, since this is our focus, Pray for your own gifts to be made known to you so that you can work in covenant with everybody sitting around you, with everybody in this church who is here today and not here today, so that you understand your gifts and how your gifts go to build up the body of Christ. And together, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are your people gathered here together in your name, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is the head of our church. And we pray that as church, we may discern your will as indicated by the movement of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you will make your spirit known to each and every one of us so that we can work in big ways and in small ways to help this church, to serve this church, and to guide this church into the future, wherever that is that you're taking us. We pray that we will have the faith, the courage, the energy, and the willingness to use those gifts, not for our own glory, not to be noticed, but to serve Jesus Christ. We pray for all churches that are going through this time of transition, and we pray the same for them. We pray for our community, 
amidst all kinds of division and differences of opinion on so many things, we pray that we will be united in knowing Jesus, in seeking Jesus, and serving Jesus. Lord, this is our prayer today, that amidst our diversity of gifts as people here in this church and in all your churches, that amidst our diversity of gifts there will be unity of faith, that in the true congregational tradition we will be free to follow Christ. We will be free to go where the Spirit leads us, and we will be free to serve the one who calls us and who sustains us. And we pray now in his name and the words that he taught us, together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Two things before we do our offertory. Sherry, my apologies to you. I, I do know that I sent you a slide of a, a, of a book, and I forgot to, there it is, thank you. I forgot to mention that. Where did I take, I think that's my kitchen table. It almost, it looks like it's my floor, but. Uh. So anyway. This book, The Congregational Way of Life, is a really fine uh, book about congregationalism. And as Bill mentioned at the beginning, we're going to be talking about different aspects of that uh, over the next six weeks. Uh, and, and I will rely heavily on this book. I just wanted to mention it so you've seen it. I know some of you are reading it or have read it, but it is, it is a... Um, uh, it, it was written some time ago, and the author of this just passed away. But uh, it's, it's a really good book and explains a lot of things, and I, I look forward to uh, sharing more of it with you. The other thing that I wanted to talk to you about is, uh, speaking of gifts, a little story to tell you. Um, so uh, you saw my schedule. So Wednesday, don't call me on Wednesday. I'm very busy on Wednesday. Wednesday's my, I'm not ashamed to admit, I do a lot of housework. Well, maybe not a lot. I do some. I clean the bathrooms and I do the vacuuming on Wednesdays because my lovely wife has uh, told me to. And um, <laughs> she, she works on Wednesdays and, and, and I do that. So we share that. And uh, she gave me a nice gift on uh, Christmas. I, I wear hoodies a lot. And she gave me this really nice, warm L.L. Bean hoodie with a lining in it and everything. And it's really warm. And you know, a few weeks ago, it was really, really cold. And I had that thing on on Wednesday when I did uh, my housework. And I'm down on my hands and knees scrubbing the bathroom floors with the bleach. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. OK. <laughs> See, some of you know that. <laughs> Well, you knew that. I just found that out. So it's dark blue, and now the sleeve is bright red. Oh. Now, like from here to there is all red. And this is, did I mention, this is a nice hoodie. Nice L.L. Bean, really high quality with the lining and everything. So Mrs. T.C. was not really too happy with me because I, I was not a good steward of that gift. It wasn't that I was careless. It wasn't that I was not taking care of it, but I just didn't, I didn't, re I kind of knew, but I, I just, I got, well, I wasn't thinking. I apologize. I told you I was a doofus, right? So anyway. And the only reason I offer it is to say it is a good reminder for all of us that all the gifts that we receive, the gifts that you got at Christmas, the gifts that God gives you, the gifts that you are the beneficiary, uh, beneficiary of on a daily basis, we are all called to be good and faithful stewards of those gifts. So as we have our offertory song and the ushers wait upon us for the offering, let us remember that scripture reminds us that God loves a cheerful giver and we are to be good and faithful stewards of all God's gifts. And the song we'll be singing during the offering is Here I Am, Lord. I'm the Lord of sea and sky. I have heard my people cry. Oh, dwell in dark and sin. My hand will save. I obey the stars of night. Oh, 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts that are in gratitude returned for what you have blessed us so richly, so many ways and so many facets of your great love has been shown to us. In return, make these gifts holy. May they be useful in building your kingdom here on earth. And we make this prayer in the name of Jesus, the head of our church. Amen. 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 Our last song is Turn Your Radio On. If anybody wants instruments, there they are. Adults, kids, anybody. I'm listening to a radio station where the mighty hosts of heaven sing. Turn your radio on, turn your radio on, turn your radio on, turn your radio on. If you want to hear the song of Zion coming from the land of endless spring, get in touch with God. Get in touch with God. Turn your radio on, turn your radio on. Listen in to the glory that chorus Listen to the glad on us roll Turn your radio on, turn your radio on Turn your radio on, turn your radio on Get a little taste of joy awaiting Get a little heaven in your soul Get in touch with God, get in touch with God Turn your radio on, turn your radio on And listen to the music in the air Turn your radio on, and the glory share we go forth from this meeting house let us go forth conscious of the gifts that we have been given and mindful that they are to be used for the building up of the body may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord be gracious to you and show his face to you and may the lord look upon you all with kindness and give you his peace amen amen, amen. amen.
great week, everybody.